You know, I'm not sure if you noticed, and I mention this oftentimes in September, how September is really a unique time of year. I, I think we are so conditioned by the school year that, you know, we think in terms of, okay, June, time to fool around, time to be a little less responsible. Then all of a sudden, September comes along, the weather gets a little colder, the pastor starts wearing suits again, he starts going back his goatee and his, his mustache. You know, I really wonder, like, for people that come during the summer, like, whoa, what's going on? Why is the pastor like, <laughs> you know, I even think in terms of the messages that I've done that, like, normally we're going verse by verse and going through books of the Bible, and we'll get to that. Uh, but today, I've decided to do a message that really addresses just the larger aspect of our Christian lives in terms of just where is God in your life. And what I would like to do is use your car as an analogy. And so where is God in your life based in really what you have in your car? And so therefore, the first place we have to start is thinking of God being in your trunk. You know, is God in your trunk? I would imagine there's many people here that God is not in your trunk. But some people, God is in your trunk. And there's some pretty important things in your trunk, right? I mean, you've got your jumper cables, you've got the scraper, you've got your tire iron. And yet what I would ask you to think is how often do you think of those things when you're driving? Like never, right? Like you only think of it when there's a problem. Then if you're like me, you're saying, I hope those jumper, jumper cables on the, are in the trunk. I hope that spare tire has air in it. But other than that, you're just going along. You're driving and you're thinking you've got the radio on and you don't care what's in the trunk because you've got it all in, 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 in your hands. You, you, you are in control of everything that's going on. And so what I would ask you, do we have a slide? <laughs> what I would ask you or, or ask you to consider isn't that what most people do with God. Don't God, doesn't, don't people normally in their relationship with, not, not, again, not you, but the people you interact with really have God in the trunk. In other words, basically, they're, they're just going along in their lives. They, they don't care about necessarily the conviction of God or God's, God's guidance or God's input. They're just doing their thing until someone gets sick, until there's a problem. I mean, really, this is the idea of there's no atheist in a foxhole. When all of a sudden the tornado's coming and the hurricane's coming, now everyone's looking for their Bible. Everyone's praying to God. And yet, really, what it comes down to is God, is, it's like he's in, his, he's, he's in the trunk. And what's amazing to me is that people that are like that think that they're okay. <laughs> like, they, they're like, the amazing thing to me is that they're not even going to listen to this message. Part of the idea of doing this message is when you meet people that have God in your trunk, you have to recognize, you have to tell them, God is in your trunk. You're treating him like he's a byword, like he's secondary, like, you, you, like it doesn't work this way in terms of the economy of God. But again, they think they're okay because their reference point is unbelievers. Their reference point is atheists, and they think, well, you know something, at least he's in the trunk. At least when I have a problem, I pray to him. But again, they are the ones that need to be in control. See, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be able to live their lives, to be gratified, but when they're gratified, have fun when they want and the way they want. They just don't want any conviction from God, no guidance from God. God, God they don't want God to interrupt their lives. It's amazing to me when I've talked to people like that, they insist that they're saved. They insisted, but I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer. There was that time where I was at church at a Billy Graham crusade or whatever. And you know something? Maybe you are, but you have to understand that God says that his Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. So what I'm tempted to say to people like that is, what is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Like, has there ever been a time where you've been convicted of sin? Is there ever a time where you've had a desire for God, where all of a sudden, I want to go to church, I want to pray, I, I want to become more righteous, I want to become more holy? See, people I have God in the trunk oftentimes don't even think that way. Again, God is just there for a certain portion of their life where I'm in trouble, and other than that, he, he's, again, he's there. But you know something, it just doesn't work with God in your trunk. 
I mean, God is always banging, let me out, <laughs> let me out. You know those little levers that you have in your trunk that can, you know, you can release a trunk from the inside? God would love to be able to pull that, but he's not going to do it until you let him out. See, see, basically God is not going to play that game. He might throw you a bone every now and then. He, he might like reveal himself to basically encourage greater faith, greater fidelity in terms of your life. But he can't, he, can't see, he can't regard that in a way that is consistent with what he seeks to do in your life. See, because ultimately, we have to understand that God is not just a problem solver. God is a relational God. And you don't need God just for circumstances. You need God for transformation. See, that's what God is about. God is about coming into us and making us who he wants us to be. That, that basically your greatest problem is in your head. <laughs> your greatest problem is not in your circumstances. It's how you engage with circumstances. What circumstances do to you? What relationships do to you? And if God is only a problem solver, then guess what? When it comes to all those things that happen in the context of life, you're not going to have the answers. You're not going to have the solutions. You're not going to have the relationship where the things of God really are going to matter. You know, I was talking to someone just this week, and I said, you know, there's one thing to have the knowledge of God. It's another thing to have the faith of God. See, for you to know things about God and then try to believe them, and believing them doesn't work. God, I believe you're sovereign. God, I believe you're powerful. God, I believe you can solve this problem. But it doesn't help. Your soul is still at unrest. You're not at peace. You don't have joy. You don't have all the things the Bible talks about. And oftentimes what people do with that, well, you know something I tried to say, I think I tried God because I prayed. I, I went to church once. <laughs> you know, I, I've tried. No, 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 no. You have to understand that there's a whole backdrop of what ultimately God wills and what he's provided for you to, to, to form and transform your life. And so again, people in the trunk, it just doesn't work that way. God, God, doesn't, God is not going to play that way, and you're not really going to receive from God what he ultimately desires. Now we have God in your back seat. You know, you think about the things that you have in your back seat. I mean, what, what, what things are there? Things that need to be readily available, to, but still at arm's length. Stuff you move from the front seat, Right? Like this at some point in time was probably in my front seat. <laughs> you know, got the coffees and it's there, but then <laughs> just throw it in the back seat. You know, the, the, the bag for grocery, I don't need this readily available, but, but it has to be better than the trunk. I don't want to have to go to the trunk and get my bag. It's right there in the back seat. You know, maybe you might have issues with your car. Like I know for myself, I've got this in the back seat of my car because it got a little slow leak. And I want to remember that I've got a slow leak. I'll drive around and forget that I have a sl so I've got this in the back. But, you know, when you think about things in your back seat, isn't this true that when you try to reach for them, you kind of can't while you're driving, right? You can't try to get that thing. Like what I find about the back seat is oftentimes you're cleaning the passenger seat to get and put it in the back seat, right? You know, the policeman is coming. Let me put the thing in the back seat, right? Like we're hiding things. You know, another thing that I think about what's in the back seat is that, you know, to help you remember, the other part is you put people you like there, but they're not helping you drive. Like, I let the kids are back there, and oh, I'm so glad they're in the back seat, and then there's, but you don't see the road. You can't help me drive. I'm still in control. I'm still doing what I'm doing. You know, people in the, people with the, with people in the back seat, well, really what it comes down to is you are just a fan of Jesus. I mean, something that was popular, 510, I have a time remembering time frames like that. But remember, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Well, with God in your back seat, he is just a fan. You are just looking for him, for all the positive things that he can give you. See, basically, when you look at the Christian life, you think of the Christian life as things that you're not supposed to do. And maybe in the context of God in the backseat, again, he's still at arm's length. You're not in control here, God. But you know something? You know, I, I recognize there are things I shouldn't do, so I'm not going to do those things. And then people become content with their Christian life in terms of, of not doing 
most of the bad things. See, one thing I think about what happens in the back seat in terms of the things that we hide back there is a backseat relationship with God is when it comes to your favorite sins, when it comes to things you really like to do, again, the thing that is your default or gives you great pleasure or whatever it might be, don't touch that. That, that, that that's mine. I, I'm, I'm hiding that from you, God. See, but basically, when you think about even, so, so in the context of not doing certain things, God in your back seat means you're still doing certain things that you like a lot, but what you're not doing and what you don't understand about the Christian life is the Christian life isn't so much about what you don't do. It's about what you do do. It's about what you pursue. It's about the, the positive things you do. Like if we did a great, there was a comedian that used to say, if we all do the do's, we won't have time to do the don'ts. Um, there is an aspect of that in the Christian life. If you continue to be in God's word, you continue to be in worship, you continue to be around God's people, you continue to regard God and think about God and, and look for his direction in terms of your life, all of a sudden you'll find that greater influence happening in your life. But see, that's not going to happen with a, in, your, in the backseat person. They're going to keep God at arm's length, and I am still in control See, just being a fan of Jesus. See, you like the idea of all the benefits the Christian life brings you. You like the idea that I can talk about forgiveness. I, I, I can talk about, you know, God's mercy or God's presence. Like, again, he's in the back seat. Well, every now and then I hear his voice, you know, hey, how about this? But again, you know, whose hands are on the wheel? Who is controlling what direction the car is going in? When God is in the back seat, again, you, you're the one that's still in control. How about God in your passenger seat? You think about the things that are in your passenger seat. What I think about when it comes to the passenger seat, those are things that represent what will help you drive, right? Well, what the trip means. Like you might actually have the coffee. Not maybe not the passenger seat and the little cup holder in the in the middle, but that counts as the passenger seat. You might have your phone there for your GPS. Now don't text on this phone. That's not why it's there, right, officer? No, no, I wasn't texting. I was just looking periodically at my GPS. Um, and so, 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 so therefore, what's in the passenger seat? Again, are things that actually do help you drive. And so that's a really an expression. Of this whole idea is God is my co-pilot right? He's the one that's sharing in my life. I'm letting him have access. Now, it may appear that the gap between the trunk to the back seat is bigger than the gap between the back seat and the passenger seat, but in some ways it is not. Maybe in terms of faith, maybe in terms of what you really regard God as, you know, there's a smaller gap between the trunk and the back seat, but when you think about how your life is impacted, when all of a sudden you're confronted by the idea that God wants me to pick up my cross and die daily. I am crucified with Christ, and I've died with him in terms of my life. You know, that's the, like, like the changes in your life will be greater from the back seat to the, to the passenger seat. In terms of, again, God's permission to speak into your life. You know, so therefore, you, you, like, you finally see that your relationship with him has to be consistent. There has to be constant dependence, easy accessibility. I want God right there. You know, for the song that we sang today, learning to need you. I think the process that happens from the back seat to the passenger seat, again, we learn to need him. We learn what he, we're appreciating what he's there for. You know, basically beforehand, I was in complete control in terms of where I was going, but in the passenger seat, I at least regard God to be able to give me some direction, to say where I should go. But basically, I am still in control. I am still determining where we're going. You know, oftentimes people that have God in their backseat, what they're praying is they're praying, God, help me with my plans. God, I have plans, 
as best as I can, I'm, tr- I'm not trying to do things that are wrong. I'm not trying to do things that are ungodly, but they're my plans. And so, God, help me with my plans. That, that, that's a picture I would like to have you think in terms of, again, where you are in the concepts of God in your life. Is, is God just speaking direction? Is he, is he just guiding you in the things that you're doing? See, when God is in your passenger seat, you're recognizing he has a right to determine, to determine your direction. Have input in the person you become. Sin is being addressed. Like all of a sudden in the back seat, you're, you're, you're trying to hide things. You're, you're trying to get away with things. You're trying to protect things. No, God, that, that, that is too dear for me, God. That time is too geared for me. That, that resource is too dear for me. You know, my, again, the right that I have to say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, that is too dear to me. All of a sudden, you get in the passenger seat, and wow, you know something? The, 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 these things really are hurtful. These really things really are harmful. That, that, that this sin is corrupting my life. It's corrupting my heart. It, it's causing me to be distant from God. This God that now all of a sudden, I want him closer. I want him to be more available. I want him to be more accessible. But, but you know, so, so therefore we start shedding the sin. We start shedding the things that are wrong. We're recognizing that, that, I mean, the ultimate truth of Scripture, when God says not to do something, he's not trying to harm us. Where, where he, where he, he, he is trying to help us in terms of that. So him saying not to sin is not harming us, but it is helping us. And so basically now, with God as your co-pilot, as it says here, things are pretty good with God as your co-pilot. His days in the trunk seem so foolish to you now. Like, why did I, like, why did I put him there? Like, why, why did I just pray to him when I had problems? Now, now, now I can pray to him all the time. Now, now I can pray to him when there's not a problem. I can pray to him just to have greater fellowship. I can can pray to him just to have greater interaction with him, to enhance his knowledge, to enhance his worship in my heart. Again, it seems so foolish. You see the benefits that come from obedience and consistent fellowship with the Almighty. That is until you look and you see whose hands are on the wheel. You see the difference between God asking to be involved with your plans and you giving up the reins and turning to God in the passenger seat and saying, why don't you drive? Why don't you drive? And as God takes the wheel, he directs you to the glove compartment and asks you to open it. And when you see the bill of sale, the ownership papers, you realize you were his all along. And you read 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. And it says here, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. To just realize God's direction for your life is for him to be in the driver's seat. I I bet the person that came up with that idea of God is my co-pilot and there were bumper stickers and there were little things you wore. Like they thought they were probably doing a great thing. But God is not supposed to be the co-pilot. God is supposed to be driving the train. He's supposed to be flying the plane. He's supposed to be driving the car. He's the one that is determining. He is the one that is deciding where you go, what you pursue, what you become. And to know that the God of the heavens is willing to do that. Like, again, that's an essential part of his person, essential part of his plan is to involve himself more in your life. But even more than that, it's not so much about him. See, I even get tripped up in those words. It's not about him getting involved in your life. It's you getting involved in his life. You getting involved in his power, his plan, what he's doing with you. And it's very, you know, we have to, you know, have, be very discerning in terms of just how we're regarding God. And again, how much control we are maintaining because we like to be in control. 
that I like to be the one that, that is determining what's happening. And yet the other side of that, in the greater glory, the greater purpose of God is to show that you're not your own. You, you've been bought with a price. I see three things here in terms of just what God is communicating, why this makes sense. I see first about, first the fact, well, actually, I think there's four things here, but the four, third one is kind of like two, two of the same thing. But anyways, the first thing is God is your creator. That because God is your cre- creator, it only makes sense that you are his. It only makes sense that he would be the one that determines what is right. You know, when you think about the things that you have created and the, the wisdom that you have for what that thing should become, what is right for that thing? Like, you know what's valuable in the things that you have created. And to know that God has created us, he, he knows what helps. He knows what hurts. He knows the standards you should live by. And so, again, to trust him. See, to me, it makes no sense to have an understanding of God, even to the extent of him being in the trunk. You have some idea that God is up there, and even when you're in trouble, we're in the foxhole, the storm is coming, I'm going to pray to him. You have that understanding of God, and yet you're not going to let him drive? You're not going to go at least be in the back seat? <laughs> you know, arm's length? <laughs> you know, are you at least going to get in the passenger seat? See, it makes no sense to me to say, yeah, I get there's a God up there, but I'm not going to listen to him. I'm not, I'm not going to, and, and, and when you think about what is involved in that, there's pride, there's fear, like I, I don't know what that's going to look like, I don't know what that's going to mean for my life, what are my friends going to say? But see, when it comes to God as creator, if you understand that God has made you, that you are not a mistake, you are not a being that has been created by, by chance, Your being that has been created by choice, and it's God's choice, and it's He who has made you. Again, you've received from God, the Spirit, who you've received from God. God is the high one. God is the one who has created you. The second thing, I think, and probably the greater emphasis of the passage, is I see salvation. I see the price that Jesus paid for you. And again, another reason, why should God be in the front seat? I should probably have another chair here. I mean, God God is in the driver's seat. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. Your salvation cost Jesus something. And so therefore now, what would we ever think of holding back? What we would ever think to say, I'm going to control this. I'm going to determine this. I'm going to keep my hands on the wheel to a Savior that has died for us. That's the picture here. You've been purchased with a price, so therefore, what regard does that bring? What trust does that bring? What love does that bring? What trust does that bring in saying, okay, God, you've got it. Like, you're worthy of this. You earned this. You were bought at a price, and that price was Christ. And that, and that price was a sacrifice that was so great in terms of physical suffering, but also great in terms of spiritual suffering. You know, when Jesus prayed, God, take this cup from me. To think that Christ himself, even in regarding the payment, the, the cost it would make it, God, is there another way? Like, please, can we come up with another solution? But not your will, not my will, but your will be done. See, that is, that is Jesus. I don't think Jesus ever doubted in, in, in essence like, that he was going to go to the cross. But showing even, like, if I could avoid this, I would. But I can't, regard, I can't avoid this. I think God would ultimately tell Jesus, Son, we've had this conversation. Son, we know why this is necessary. You have to go to the cross. But I think what Jesus was most fearful of is being separated from his father. I mean, the pain was pretty painful. 39 lashes, crown of thorns, carrying a cross, nails. Yeah, 
all of it, great physical pain. But to think of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus crying those words, not because he didn't know, but he wanted us to understand why it was happening. Why is this darkness? What's going on? What's being accomplished on the cross? I was separated from God. He he who knew no sin became sin for you, so that in him you might have the righteousness of God. God. And so think about it again. That is the price. And so again, you're not your own. You've been purchased with the price. God's got the ownership papers. Even as you're driving with him in the trunk, he still has the ownership papers. But he's welcoming you into relationship with him. Like he's welcoming me into relationship with him where he will figure it all out. All the implications, all the things. Like, well, like, I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that's going to mean. God has got it. But, but, but part of the faith... You know, that that faith even like a child that says, I just believe? Yeah, that that, see, that's what taking taking the hands off the wheel is having that faith like a child. Say, yeah, God, I I can't can't hold on anymore. I can't try to control this. I can't manage it. You have to manage it. Again, to know that God, again, projects that he wants that. The third thing that really becomes four things is the Holy Spirit. So therefore, there's God as creator, there's the salvation that Jesus has offered, the purchase price, but the only injunction here is do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Like to me, that's both about power and presence. Like like the Holy Spirit is there, and so therefore when you're in need, where you don't have the capacity to choose or do right, that's what the Holy Spirit is there. When you think about, oh, God, is, God, are you present with me? Are you here? Can I rely on you? Yes, the, the Holy Spirit is always there. And so the, 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 the thought for us is always you know, to not be grieving that Spirit, not to be quenching that Spirit, to be confessing our sins, to allow the Spirit's power to continue to be present in our life, but to know that God offers that and it is a basis of conviction, it's a basis of knowledge, it's a basis of, of, of desire in terms of pursuing the things of God. Again, recognizing you're not your own. See, when you think about even that dichotomy of, I'm not doing the wrong things, but am I doing the right things? Again, am I desiring God? Am I pursuing God? God. Yesterday in our 10 days of prayer, it was moving from apathy to passion. And so this message really is about moving from apathy to passion. To not think about what your needs are, what you need to accomplish, and asking God to be part of that, to go to God and say, God, what do you need to accomplish through me? And that's, that's how we engage with life. That's how we engage with God. And we continue to grow in that. You know, I would like to take a moment of silence for us to, in, in your own hearts, to engage with God. And I really want you to think, God, where have I placed you? God, are you in the trunk? Like, have, have I relegated you to a place where I am just coming to you when I'm in need? And other than that, God, I'm all set. Well, God, I've got you in the back seat. You know, I, I want you there. I like your presence. I, I like that I can hear you laughing, but you're at arm's length. And don't, don't look under the front seat because there's something there that I'm trying to protect. Or is he just in the passenger seat? Hey, hey give me direction, but my hands are still on the wheel. Let's bow, and then we'll just take a few minutes to, to think about that before God, and then I'll close in prayer.
Father, I thank you that when we are challenged to make you more, that when we come to you, we come to a God of grace, we come to a God of love, we come to a God of mercy, uh, but Father, we also come to a God that is righteous, and again, you're, 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 you're not fooling around, because Satan certainly isn't fooling around, and, and what we need to exist in this world is not a game. And so, Father, I, ju I just pray that uh, wherever you are in our lives, I, I pray that we move you up. I, I pray that all of us understand and, and desi decide to let you take the wheel. Father, I, I pray that you would show us those things that are preventing that. I, I pray that you would reveal even where we are. Father, when we think about the fullness of fellowship, the fullness of following, the fullness of passion, that the fullness of what is right in your economy. Father, I pray that whatever is keeping us from that, you would, you would show us what that is. And that, Father, we would be willing to let go and let you, in terms of what you are fostering, what you are leading us to, what you are willing and desiring. Father, I don't believe this is an idea for a moment. I don't think this is an idea for one Sunday and then let, let's let that go. But maybe that's something we focus on for the 10 days. So maybe that's something we focus on for the, for the rest, of our, rest of the year, rest of our lives in terms of just what am I allowing you to become for me, for you, in terms of what you're looking for for me to be in the context of my relationship with you, our relationship with you. And so, Father, lead, us, guide, lead and guide us in, in, in the context of, of, of your grace and your righteousness, your love and your truth, that we would not overtax ourselves and we would not undertax ourselves. So thank you for this time we've had together. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen.